So we talked about the history of anime magical girls, but have you ever heard of magical boys? The concept of magical boys in anime, while not as prevalent or popular as magical girls, has still left an undeniable mark on anime. Welcome to the Nerdy Magical Girl podcast, and today let's discuss an overview of magical boys in anime. Let's start off by reviewing the criteria of what makes a character or anime to be considered a magical girl as a baseline when we're talking about their counterparts. The characteristics are as follows. A transformation sequence of some kind, possesses magical abilities that they usually, but not always, use via an alter ego. Typically, the protagonist is a young girl. The anime or manga series can be targeted at any demographic. And usually, the protagonist has to solve some form of a problem or complete a destiny mission of some kind. Since we have an established framework for magical girls, we are going to use the same one for magical boys, as many of these examples do follow these guidelines. Also, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of every magical magical boy to ever exist. This is just an overview. With that, let's kick it off in 1984. In 1984, Kimagori Orange Road centers on Kiyosuke Kasuga, who does his best to hide his paranormal powers. And each time his powers are discovered, he is forced to change schools. So this go round, being the new kid in school is nothing new to him. But at this new school, Kiyosuke meets a girl who is actually the school delinquent and immediately falls in love with her. It's unfortunate though that Kiyosuke's abilities are not very central to the plot. They are more so used for like cheap gag humor, and things like that and I feel could have been explored more. In 1985, Saint Seiya or Saint Seiya Knights of the Zodiac is a story that focuses on an orphan named Seiya who is forced to go into the sanctuary of Greece to obtain this sacred armor also known as cloths. These cloths derive from cosmic constellations that represent a symbolic guardian. The warriors who don these cloths are called saints and they are tasked with defending the reincarnation of the Greek goddess Athena. Seiya is the protagonist of the story and is also known as Pegasus Seiya and is protected by the Pegasus constellation, thus wearing the Pegasus cloth. I just said the word Pegasus so much in one sentence. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Seiya is known for his determination, generosity, and being a bit impulsive. He is cunning and confident in battle and stays true to his morals. He has various attacks with some of them being Pegasus meteor fist and rolling crush. And Saint Seiya does have a transformation sequence and also as he grows stronger, he gets variants of his armor down the line. Think like regular Sailor Moon versus like Sailor Moon Cosmos. And just overall, all of the saints would be considered magical boys. Moving on to 1992, we have Mamoru Chiba, AKA Tuxedo Mask from Sailor Moon. Mamoru is the present day incarnation of Prince Endymion, whose alter ego is like we've established is Tuxedo Mask. As Tuxedo Mask, Mamoru wears a formal black tuxedo suit along with golden buttons, a black cape with a red interior. He also wears a white mask and a formal black top hat. He wields a black cane and roses that he throws at his enemies. I I absolutely loved how Toei Animation would animate Tuxedo Mask entries in any episode. One thing Toei Animation is really good at is animating rose petals. 100 out of 100, 10 out of 10 every single time. Armour has a very quick transformation sequence into Tuxedo Mask when it's shown, which is like very rare, and activates that transformation with the Golden Crystal, which is Earth's version of the Silver Crystal. And often when he's protecting Sailor Moon, his hat and mask come off revealing his identity. Mamoru is a very deep and layered character. He is is very protective over the people he cares about, often not caring what he has to risk in order to save them, even if that means risking his life. This deep need to protect the ones that he loves and cares about deeply stems from the loneliness that he felt all his life growing up and the trauma of not only losing his parents at a very young age, but also the memory loss that followed. It's strongly alluded that Mamoru deals with a form of depression, and while he can be interpreted as standoffish and cold at times, he's actually quite considerate. His battles with grief, loneliness, and depression could also be a big reason why he doesn't cut corners with his words and he can inadvertently hurt those around him with his bluntness. At his core, he wants those he cares about to be the best versions of themselves. It's so funny like knowing that about Mamoru, I thought that he was a Virgo, but actually he is a Leo. And if you know anything about Sailor Moon, base level, earth charts matter a lot in the anime and all were very intentional choices. Also, Jedi, Nephrite, Zoisite, and Kunzite, I believe would also be considered magical boys in Sailor Moon. Stepping into to 1995 with Wedding Peach, which if you do remember, we spoke about in the history of Magical Girls. But as a refresher, Wedding Peach is a Magical Girl anime series that was a part of the 90s golden age of Magical Girls and Magical Girls series that centers on four friends who can transform into magical warriors called love angels. But fun fact, Wedding Peach also has magical boys. Yana 
Nagiba Kazuya, who transforms into the angelic-like Lamone. He assists the main characters in their battles against the forces of darkness. Think of him like the tuxedo mask of a wedding peach and is charged with watching over the love angels. But he also has a really big secret. He is a hopeless romantic and in his human form, he's actually the captain of the soccer team and a mentor to Yosuke Fuma. Speaking of Yosuke, it is revealed later in the series that he transforms into a demon forcefully due to his bloodline. Yosuke cares deeply about his friends and while he can seem abrasive at times, he really just doesn't like to wear his emotions on his sleeve. Although he is very protective of the ones that he loves and will stand up to anyone and anything, including fate, if that means protecting them. Still in that 90s golden age with card captor Sakura in 1998, which had many magical boys in their show, such as Seiren Lee, Toya Kinamoto, and Yukita Tsukishiro. Seiren Lee is the heir to the famous Lee clan of sorcerers from Hong Kong, which if you remember is the same clan that Chloe Reed's mother was a member of. He is the love interest of Sakura and while cold and aggressive at first, eases throughout the series once he realizes his feelings. He does not have a transformation sequence per se that grants him access to his abilities as he always has access to his abilities, but he does wear traditional clothes of the Lee clan when out searching for clo cards and fighting enemies. He has magical and supernatural detection and is skilled in swordsmanship, martial arts, and at one point could use the clo cards. He can also use elemental magic via slips of enchanted paper called Ofuda. Toya Kinamoto is the older brother of Sakura and has supernatural abilities due to his lineage. His abilities are of the paranormal nature, having heightened spiritual awareness, soul and aura reading, extrasensory perception, and danger sense. At one point, Toya sacrificed his powers to save Yukito, but eventually returned on their own and were stronger than before, even gaining the ability to temporarily stop time. Now on to Toya's boyfriend, Yukito. Yukito is a very interesting person. While in his human form, he is very polite, athletic, and popular, he actually houses an alter ego called Yue. Yue can will Yukito into transforming into him. Yue is a guardian of the Clo cards and was created by Clo Reed. Now, Yue is well aware of Yukito, but Yukito was not always aware of Yue, but eventually he does also become aware of Yue. Yukito's transformation sequence is short. He kind of just changes into Yue. And unlike Yukito, Yue is very cold and distant and aloof, but has a kind heart. Phantom Thieves Jin is a magical girl shoujo manga series created in 1998 with an anime debuting in 1999. Chikai Nagoya is the male lead protagonist of the story, opposite of the main protagonist, Meran Kusakabe. Has the ability to transform into the Phantom Thief Jean, the reincarnation of Joan of Arc, and Chikai Nagoya has the ability to transform into the thief Sinbad. Who is Jean's rival? Both have similar abilities of catching demons, and there is a big twist in the middle of the anime that I won't reveal, but I will say it is a very interesting rival to lovers type of anime. Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters came out in 2001, and y'all thought I wasn't gonna bring up my boy Yugi, but you thought? Wrong. <laughs> Yugi Moto is the star of the show in Yu-Gi-Oh, who after solving the puzzle of an ancient Egyptian artifact, inherits the ancient spirit and alter ego of the Pharaoh Atem. When Yugi plays a high stakes game of dual monsters, he transforms into the Pharaoh. Now you may remember that recently the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh, Kazuki Takahashi passed away while trying to save others that were caught in a riptide. I still collect Yu-Gi-Oh cards to this day. And if it weren't for this series, I would not have the courage to have had gone up and talked to other people people in school and asked to trade my magician of faith for, I don't know, the red archery girl. Yu-Gi-Oh gave me the courage to reach out and try and make friends with people. And I definitely have Takahashi to thank for that. Takahashi was honestly a hero. Rest in peace, legend. In 2001, Pre-Tier came onto the scene and it's like one of my favorite magical girl series. Pre-Tier centers on Himino Awayuki, who is the next in line to take up the mantle of Pre-Tier, a magical warrior princess slash chosen one that has the power to stand up to the princess of disaster. The Pre-Tier here is protected by the Leafy Knights, who all have the power to not only transform themselves, but to also combine their particular elemental abilities with the pre-tier. That combination of powers and transformation sequence is called preeding. I'm not joking, it's really, that's really what it's called. Don't judge the early 2000s, be quiet. <laughs> when preeding with the pre-tier, <laughs> <laughs> when preening with the pre-tier, she does draw off the power of the Lee Fei Knights heavily. While every Lee Fei Knight does not get equal screen time in the anime, there is one transformation sequence that does not appear in the anime at all because it's a little dark. But here's a brief list of the Lee Fei Knights and their powers. Hayate is a Knight of the Wind. Sasame, the Knight of Sound. Kei is the Lee Fei Knight of Light. 
Go, the night of fire, Manin, the night of ice, Hajime, the night of water, and Shin, the night of plants, and is the youngest out of all the Leafy Nights. D and Angel came out in 2003, and it is also one of my favorite animes. <laughs> Definitely in my top 20. The story centers on Daisuke Niwa, who comes from a family with a genetic mutation that allows the men to transform into Dark Mousy, an infamous phantom thief. The transformation is sparked when Daisuke thinks a little too much about his romantic crush, which, as you can imagine, can get awkward at times. Satoshi Hiwatari, a classmate and rival of Daisuke, also has a secret genetic mutation in his family and houses an alter ego named Krad. Krad can take over Satoshi's body when strong attachments are formed. They don't have to necessarily be romantic in the sense. Like Daisuke and Satoshi, Dark and Krad are also rivals. Dark being a famous art thief and Krad being created by an artist, which that artist is very pivotal to the plot. All I will say is Dark and Krad's beef is centuries old and goes way back and it's very, very mystical. Also, the theme song for D and Angel slaps. I will be taking no feedback on that. <laughs> Chrono Crusade came out in 2003, which is also one of my top 20 anime favorites of all time. It is so, so, so good, but trigger warning for religious stuff if you're sensitive to that. People describe this anime as the anime with nuns and guns, which is so camp, but the plot goes so much deeper than that. The story centers on Rosette Christopher, who is on a quest to find her younger brother, Joshua. Rosette forms a contract with a devil named Chrono, but we'll get back to that in a second. Joshua is MIA because he is something called an apostle of Fatima, one of seven on earth chosen by God. Each of the seven apostles represents a holy virtue, and Joshua is the apostle of hope. Being an apostle, like all the other apostles, gave Joshua the ability to heal others, but he lacks the ability to heal himself of his sickness, which that sickness actually derives from the strain that being an apostle has on his body. He also has the potential to access the astral lines, a sort of like holy energy or power of God himself. Joshua can only perform this feat when he is in a sort of angelic form, which is not something he has been shown to be able to access on his own. We only see it when he's forced to access it. Now back to Rosette and Chrono. Chrono is a powerful demon who forms a contract with humans in order to access his power in the human world. The nature of the contract is always the same. He takes the life force of his contractor, who in this case is Rosette. And with this contract, he is able to transform into his full demonic form and use his powers. The contractor wears a clock around their neck that is always ticking backwards. This is a beautifully crafted anime and hold on to your chairs and grab some Kleenex because this one it will take you for a wild ride. Also, this one has a great opening theme song too. Now, Kiba came out in 2006. I distinctly remember having a really dope soundtrack. The story centers on Zed and his friend Noah who feel like life does not really align with their potential. One day dives into this portal seeking a place where they can live a more full life and also have more freedom. As the plot continues, he gains the ability to use spells and control spirits in this new world and becomes something called a shard caster. Zed's shard mark is embedded in his left hand, where he draws power to use shards to summon his sword, control his spirit Amir Ghul, and control other abilities. This anime I definitely need to rewatch because I remember it ending in a very odd spot and it causing like some sort of division with people. Some people said it was good, some people said it was awkward, some people said it sucked. I don't know, I'd have to rewatch it for myself just to make sure. <laughs> Another trigger warning for religious trauma, Kami Chamakarin in 2007 starts off a bit on the dark side, following the main protagonist, Karin Hanazano, who is grieving the loss of her parents and her pet cat, and living under an authoritarian aunt who seems to have no regard for her feelings. Karin prays to God for a miracle while holding her mother's ring, knowing that God will help her out of this situation, when suddenly she meets Himika Kajio and Kazune Kujo, who play pivotal roles in Karin's character development. Kazune, the male protagonist, has a ring that is imbued with the power of Apollo, granting him a god form and the ability to use a bow and arrow. He also uses the power of Uranus and has the ability to use a staff. Some people refer to this anime as Sailor Moon, but add Greek and Roman mythology, which I can definitely see that perspective in some instances. But this romantic anime has a lot of twists and turns and does not shy away from tough topics such as grief, faith, loss and love. Yuko Chara is a shoujo manga series that was created in 2005 by the iconic duo Peach Pit and released as an anime in 2007. The story centers on Amu Hinamari, who is struggling with being herself at school. 
she makes a wish to be able to be her true self and wakes up to find three eggs in her bed. These eggs contain creatures that are called Shugocharas, who aid Amu on her journey of self-discovery. Ikuta Tsukiyomi is introduced as an antagonist to the plot, who is a part of a villainous group tasked with finding the very eggs that just hatched in Amu's room. He's 15 years old, a skilled violinist, and, and actually wants to be free of this villainous group he works for in order to pursue his own goals. He can transform into a cat form known as Black Lynx, where he gains cat-like reflexes, senses, and appearance. He uses his violin as a weapon and can also turn it into a death scythe. Nagahiko Fujisaki has male and female transformations. When they transform into Beat Jumper, they will use he, him pronouns and gain heightened athletic prowess. When transformed into their female form called Yamato Mahime, they use she, her pronouns and is a graceful dancer with dance-based attacks. Tadase Hitori from the same anime will transform sometimes when anyone says the word prince or dead end around him. His transformation is called Platform Royale, where he transforms into a confident and king-like warrior. He has a golden staff and sword and is well-balanced in offensive and defensive skills. Is This a Zombie came out in 2011. And while this anime is of the fan servicey type, which isn't like my favorite thing in the world, this anime is a staple in the magical boy genre. The main character of this anime, Ayumu Ayakawa, is murdered when he goes to investigate a very weird house. He is resurrected directed by a necromancer and is turned into a zombie. He gains the ability to transform, immortality, the ability to absorb magic, and he can actually transform into like different variants of himself. Those variants give him forms of strength and abilities. Which is giving very cutie honey. As a downside though of being a zombie, he actually also develops an aversion to the sun, which can leave him dehydrated and causes him great pain. I love Blue Exorcist. Blue Exorcist is an anime that premiered in 2011 and it's season three, as of the recording of this video, is currently underway. Rin and his twin brother Yukiko are sons of Satan who were raised by an exorcist. One day, Satan tries to forcefully take over Rin's body, and while that attempt seemingly fails, Rin's supernatural abilities are unleashed and he gains demon-like features, which become more pronounced when he unsheathes his sword. Kind of like a mini transformation. Yukio also awakens his abilities, but much later in the series. Blue Exorcist I was not expecting to be so good. I thought initially it was in like the Chrono Crusade wheelhouse of themes and symbols when it comes to religious stuff, but it's definitely good in its own right. This is a series where I encourage you all to not only just watch the anime, but please read the manga. It is so good. The Magical Girl or Manga released in 2014, getting an anime series in 2018. Saki Uno discovers her mother used to actually be a magical girl, but due to back problems could no longer fulfill her role, thus passing that role down to Saki. But instead of the traditional cutesy magical girl form, Saki's transformation, Saki's form is actually a large muscular man in a cute magical girl outfit. This gets really complicated for Saki when her crush Mihiro develops feelings for her transformed state. And so does her idol partner Sakuyo, who actually also has the same abilities as Saki. This is a whirlwind tale. <laughs> 2015's Cute High Earth Defense Club is literally an all-encompassing magical boy series. The story focuses on five boys who are given powers by an alien from outer space. Each boy is granted a nature-based power and gains the ability to transform. Yamoto Hakune transforms into the sparkling prince battle lover, and his color is red and his element is light. Ian Yufian transforms into the flashing prince battle lover Cerulean. His color is blue and his element is water. Atsushi Kinugawa transforms into the piercing prince battle lover Apinard. His color is green and his element is air. Ayo Naruko transforms into the roaring prince battle lover Sulfur. His color is yellow and his element is earth. And Ryo Zhao transforms into the Thilling Prince battle lover Vesta. His color is pink and his element is fire. This is like quintessential magical boy vibes. And it's really funny as it pokes fun at the magical girl genre. Fairy Ranmaru in 2021 follows five male fairies disguised as humans. They work at a mysterious bar outside the city and offers to heal the woes of their human clients. They do not take money in exchange for their services for making them smile smile and wiping away their tears, but they do steal their hearts. Renmaru Ai, a fairy from the Lux clan, is considered to be the elite of the fairy world. He is kind and caring and 
and a bit of a scatterbrain. Homaro Haderase is a high school delinquent and is constantly at odds with Uru Siren. Uru Siren thinks very highly of himself and strives to be perfect in everything that he does. He considers himself to be successful in being perfect majority of the time. And if you couldn't tell, he is very arrogant. Hence why he's always at odds with Homura. Jayuka Mutsuoka is a student and heir of the Arbor Clan. Its fairy form has a green and gold aesthetic. Takara Yudashiro is a fairy from the Metalum Clan and is a very good cook and actually takes care of the group's finances. He also has this weird obsession with passing on his legacy and I will not be going into any further detail than that. Soaring Sky Pretty Cure is the 20th installment in the Pretty Cure franchise. And for the love of Mars, Pluto, and the moon, please stop saying that I overlooked Pretty Cure in my History of Magical Girls video. I'm just gonna put it out there right now. I left it out intentionally because it needs its own video. Okay, did you just hear what I said, 20th installment? My ADHD brain could not figure out how to like compress almost like 21 years of content into like five sentences. But yes, Pretty Cure will be getting its own video because yes, it is essential to the magical girl genre. But anywho, Pretty Cure was monumental in the early 2000s magical girl anime era that really held the baton and kept that feeling of the 90s magical girl era afloat. With over 20 years of original content, Yunaki Tsubasa is the second male cure in the entirety of the franchise, but I believe the first to be centralized to the cure team. Tsubasa is from the Skylands Puny Bird tribe, a tribe that actually gave up the power of flight in exchange for the power to become human, which personally is not a trade I would have made. With his eyes to the sky with a strong desire to fly, Tsubasa transforms into the pretty cure of wings, Cure Wing. The first male cure is Wakamiya Henry from Hugdo Precure. He transforms into Cure Infinity, and unlike the other cures, he has no Mirai crystal in order to transform. I think what sets Cure Infinity and Cure Wing apart is that they are genuine cures and not used as like a joke or a gag or comic relief to move the plot along. They are legitimate cures. Now I do have some Magical Boy honorable mentions and also some honorable mentions who fit or loosely fit with Magical Boy characteristics. Elfman from Fairy Tale, Ichigo from Bleach, Bakura from Yu-Gi-Oh! Tamaki from My Hero Academia, Escanor from Seven Deadly Sins, Aladdin and Sinbad from Magi, The Labyrinth of Magic, every male character with a Zodiac spirit from Fruits Basket, Soul from Soul Eater, and Aaron Yeager. <laughs> oh my God, but like it fits if the shoe fits. Could you imagine Attack on Titan as just like a magical boy series? Let's move on. Now, for clarification, magical boys are an extension of the magical girl genre because one would not exist without the framework, history, and popularity of the other. Some of these series and characters can be thought of as a parody of the magical girl genre, and that may be true in a lot of ways. However, seeing magical boys pop up and take a rise in the 1980s makes sense because major laws were being passed during that time pertaining to equality and being able to express oneself more openly. Yet these laws in Japan society and also many societies around the globe still need a lot of work and have a long way to go. A lot of these series show characters in a more liberated form of masculinity. They are softer and at times sensitive with cool powers and transformations and show the complexities of life via their stories and quests. Sometimes these characters are dealing with very tough things such as depression, grief, anxiety, loss, and many of them are just very campy and very queer. And that's that's awesome too. <laughs> now, there will be no new episode of the podcast next week because I actually do try to keep these to a bi-weekly schedule for my own sanity, for my own health. Plus, I'm working on a separate project and my time is a little bit split. In the meantime, I will be doing some more low lit videos and also more cozy gaming content while you wait for the next episode. But I do hope you enjoy the content that I have been uploading. And also, thank you so much to all of my new subscribers. Hi, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> If you like this content, consider giving me a five star rating if you're listening to the podcast. And if you're watching here on YouTube, give the video a like and remember to subscribe. Patrons and coffee members get early access to the episodes and bonus content. So if you'd like to join us over there, we welcome you. But who is your favorite Magical Boy or Magical Boy series? Let me know in the comments and you all have a magical day. Bye. <laughs>